Hello, good evening. God bless you. Thank you for being with us tonight. Thank you for joining us. Uh, I know if you're like us, in just a mere 12 hours, you'll have to be at work. So thank you for carving out a few hours of your night tonight to be with us. Uh, and if you watch this later, thank you for watching uh, any. Like, share, subscribe. We just want you to be a part of what we're doing. Uh, we just want to you to feel the love of God that is shed abroad in our hearts. We want you to feel that same power, that same excitement that we're experiencing. We want you to feel it at home. We want you to feel it in your car. We want you to feel it here. So come here, 1508 Hargrove Avenue at 10 o'clock on Sundays and 7 o'clock on Wednesdays, and we'll wrap our arms around you. Some arms are bigger than others, like Michael's, and so you might feel extra, extra hug and extra love from that. So come and enjoy it and be a part of what we're doing. AJ preached this past Sunday, did a fantastic job. We'll dive in to more of that kind of stuff. A um, couple people, well, you've got the three of us tonight. Uh, Josh is not with us. I think he's got a, a, a illness with a little baby boy. So he's got a few things going on. So we send our love to you, and we're missing him tonight. Um, feels like a piece of you is gone whenever we, whenever we do this and there's somebody that's not here. But uh, so we love you, uh, Josh Woods. Another fellow that we know, he's preaching tonight at at, uh, at a church in Alabama, so we send him some love and uh, have a few people that had sent some prayer requests. One, I think, was Nancy Grant, wanted us to pray for them. So uh, uh, just keep keep a few of our folks in, in prayer and keep a few of our po folks in your mind as you go to the Lord and remember them and their situations. But uh, God is good. All is <laughs> How how very how very uh, churchy of you to say, and all the time, God is good. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's the way we used to end all of our church services. In the way, uh, not here, but uh, when I was a kid at the other church, that's the way my my uncle used to do it all the time. But uh, I do believe, it. regardless of uh, situations that you go through and suffering that you go through, um, and it's more difficult to say that in the midst of suffering more difficult to say that God is good when you're dealing with contradiction, and you're dealing with things that contradict the idea that God is good. And you end up with a situation that's like Joseph, which is exactly what AJ preached about Sunday. And there's a there's a handful of things that I got from it, but there's at least two th two or three things that I want to at least mention before we dive deeper into something that AJ wants to say tonight about it. But one thing that I was reading through this week was about was Romans eight, and it just 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 for the sake of just reading it again, because I've always enjoyed reading Romans chapter eight. But it's when you get to the point where Paul says that the creation is groaning and it's travailing in birth, waiting until now. But what is it waiting for? It says the manifestation, not the manifestation of the big mighty man of God. Not the manifestation of a move, not a manifestation of a revival, not a manifestation of something else or some mysterious thing that's going on. It says the manifestation of the sons of God. So when we begin to see ourselves as sons of God, that is the revelation that the world is looking for. Because that's what the word manifestation means. It's the Greek word apocalypsis. And what it means is a taking the veil off, taking the cloak off of something, revealing something that has been there all along. So when we understand our sonness, and sometimes I think that we maybe church it up a little bit too much by even saying sonship. Not that, that, not that there are bad words or good words in the kingdom. Uh, however it is that you try to define it, go for it. We're, we're all in on it, whatever term you want to use. But sometimes I think it makes it a little bit too churchy when we say the sonship because that has to make it even more important. And now I'm a big bad son now. I'm not the, and it just makes it back more to being the big bad man of God. Somebody's got to lead this thing. It's like, uh, you know, people were, were talking about the, the revival or the movement that was going on in Asbury and how uh, – you know, everybody wanted to know, well, what was the message that kicked it off? So they, they started playing the sermon, I guess, that kicked it off. But that's, you know, whether that was the sermon that kept it going, whatever it was, it seemed like it was mostly just 24 hours of prayer and, and praising and worship, which is beautiful. 
So there wasn't a, a man that was in charge of it. There wasn't a person that was supposed to be leading this thing and directing people as to what they should be doing and, and, and whatever else. Otherwise, that makes the movement about a man. But making it about being a son of God, that is the revealing that the world is waiting on. Everything in your life, everything in your creation, the thing that surrounds you, your cosmos that you live in, it is waiting for you to reveal the thing that has always been there, that you are the son of God. The creation is groaning and it's travailing even, waiting for the manifestation. If you read it, in, I think it's in the Woost translation. It means that it's standing, literally uh, says that it's standing, creation is standing on tiptoes, waiting almost at the edge of something, waiting for the sons to reveal themselves. And then you have the story of Joseph, who was not a servant, but was sold as a servant, as a slave, but never lost his sonship. And his father instilled, I just took this off because my foot fell off. <laughs> I literally just kicked that, and then I did not mean to do that. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Stretched my foot out and just knocked it out. <laughs> Thank you, AJ. <laughs> Keep my feet back over here. I stretch my legs out sometimes under this table and I'll kick these down. I can't believe I did that. Gosh, what a rookie error. <laughs> so, <laughs> rookie move. Don't blow it for us, I, I just about did. Sorry. <laughs> Need more cowbell. Anyway, <clears throat> back to Joseph. <laughs> Joseph, who who never left or never forgot his sonship, and it's something that his father had put within him from the beginning, that because he was the son of the wife that he loved, son of Rachel, that he made him this tote. And it's the thing that began to, when A.J. began to bring this out Sunday, the design of the coat was a coat that was something that could not be worked in. It's not just that it was a coat of many colors and meaning that it was, uh, uh, easy to be spotted amongst anybody. Now anybody can see this coat anywhere that you go and see that this kid that's wearing this thing is obviously important, or at least it has some sort of value that someone would give him something that's this unique and something that's completely unique to him, but also something that cannot be worked in as to signify to his brothers and to everybody else that there is something different about Joseph. Joseph is not going to do things the way that Jacob does them because Jacob realizes for 20 years he sees a worse version of himself and his father-in-law Laban who tricks him, beguiles him, and completely ropes him in to doing whatever he wants him to do. Uh, if I'm, uh, What is it? Seven years, for the, seven years for Leah, seven years for Rachel, and another six years for for the dowry that he was supposed to get at the forefront. All of the sheep, all the cattle, everything that he was supposed to receive in the beginning he has to work another six years for the rest of that. So in totality, 20 years, I think I did my math right on that just now, seven, seven, and six. So 20 years he works for this man and come to find out he's just a worse version of him. And he sees that within himself, that he's the trickster. He's somebody that is a deceiver. And he wants to have and w or at least once he has a child with the woman that he loves and the one that he, he desired from the beginning, has this child with her, it's like what A.J. said, there was something in seeing the eyes of that beautiful little boy in his arms that says, I need to go home. I want to go back home. I don't want to be here anymore. I've been in prison. I've been in a 20-year prison sentence waiting on something that I've wanted, something that I deserve, something that and now I've had to work and work and work. So when he has this son, instead of giving him the chance to work, he says, I'm going to give him something where he can't even work in. It's not even designed for him to be able to work in. That's the kingdom that we've been given, and that's the sonship. There's no works. It's, not by, it's by faith, not by works, so that no man can boast of the salvation that he was given. It is not by anything that you have done or anything that you have earned. It is nothing that you have accomplished that gives you your salvation. It is completely based on the perfect work of Jesus Christ. So this coat that you wear, 
this sonship that you have sunk into that Colossians talks about of putting on the Christ. The thing that you have sunk into, it's a coat that is not designed for work. It is not designed for labor. It is not designed for anything but enjoyment and love and for people to see that there is something completely unique and different about this person. And it is the identification of their sonship. Um, Then you take that through for the rest of it, where his brothers rip it up. And I was telling the story again to the girls the other night, and we were talking about it last night. And how his brothers use his use him for them themselves to make money out of him. And they sell him into slavery, make money off of him. But even in the midst of all of his suffering, not to take up too much time, but in but in the midst of, of all of his suffering that he he holds true to the fact that there's something deep within him that is more valuable and is more more beautiful than the thing that he's going through. And that's difficult sometimes to keep in mind, I think. Uh, Not that I think. I think that everybody is well aware of that. that When you're going going through hell, then it's difficult to say that, oh, there's there's light at the end of the tunnel. It's difficult to say that there's something on the other side of this that is that's gonna bring glory to God in all of this. But Joseph is able to see that, and that's what his his life is the epitome of somebody who goes through it, goes through it, goes through it, and goes through it, and eventually gets to the point where he says, man, I knew this all along. I knew it all along, that God can turn any bad situation, that God can do something and make good out of it. No matter what terrible ingredient has been mixed in, there's some way that God is able to make this good and make something glorious out of it. Through all the stuff, and it's, you know, all the lost years, all the lost time of being stuck in an empty well, that was the other thing that hit me too, man. The empty well thing, that was that was a spectacular point because especially in in the church age of throwing people in an empty well and then like you said, we keep keep telling people, Well, come here, come here, come to our church and we'll just throw you in the same empty well that we're all in. We just throw you in the same thing that has no water and no sustenance, no life, throw you in the same thing that we're all living. <laughs> come and come and enjoy the dryness with us. And Jesus says that demons walk in dry places. So I guess that's the, is that what we're going? Is that that's your dry well? So here you go. <laughs> that's, that's your uh, it just takes you takes you to that point. Now it made me think of uh, well a lot of this this week. It made me think. Um, it made me think of uh, C.S. Lewis, and because uh, randomly the other day, uh, Tegan wanted because Hadley was sick. And Tegan wanted to watch uh, Chronicles of Narnia, uh, and so I don't even think that. And I don't even, bless you, I don't even think that she had ever seen it before. Uh, <laughs> that was a loud sneeze. Bless you. Bless you again. Um, but she wanted to watch the the, it was the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. So letting her, you know, she was watching through it, and you know, she asked a few questions and things. And I, I enjoyed watching it with her, but. Uh, well, you know, so looking at the books themselves, like you know, the whole series of books that C.S. Lewis wrote about it, and how it's this little girl that leads the entire thing. Yeah. Come to find out that even that C.S. Lewis wrote the book series for his little niece Lucy, who Lucy is the heroine of the story, and she's this this tiny little girl, the youngest of four children, and she's the one that has the eyes to see what has been there all along. Right. That she is able to see, kind of like Melody with the pepper with the uh, pepper grinder, <laughs> that Melody knew all along. Well, I knew all, I knew the whole time that didn't have a didn't have a head on it. I always knew it didn't have a. She see she's already seen it. She's already observed it. She's already seen it. When we saw it, everybody saw it. I've been to your house. I I couldn't have told you if it had a head on it or not. I would have never paid any attention to it. But it's it's the fact of she knew it. And that we were too grown up to see it. Yeah. We're too grown up to pay attention to the details that were staring us in the face the entire time. Right. And Lucy is young enough to have the explorative idea to go what is beyond, what is behind the rest of this wardrobe. Right. What is on the other side of this? And it's an entire world that opens up to her. And it's a place where and there's so many beautiful images that are in that in that storyline, especially of the way that, that Aslan dies on the t- on the stone table of the law and then he's the one that breaks the table and rises again and it's it's god c.s lewis god he's such a good writer brilliant writer with all of that 
but it the it, the whole idea is the entire time is you have the two older siblings that are constantly saying that this is not possible. It's completely impossible. And then you can see where they have begun to lose their childlike wonder and their ability to see even the thing that's staring them in the face. They're in this foreign land that is constantly winter, even and, and they make the point that it's always winter and never Christmas. So there's this hope for something that comes with winter that never arrives. So you've got these two older siblings that even after they've met Santa Claus himself, and he's given them this ability and these gifts to give them something to help fight this battle that they are supposed to fight, that it, even the younger sister, who's the, the second oldest, she even begins to say that just because a little man uh, in a red coat gives you a sword doesn't mean you're supposed to fight. She doesn't believe it herself. She puts no faith in the fact that they've seen this mysterious creature Santa Claus <laughs> and that they've been given a gift because they're, they're in this place. And like I said, it takes it always takes this childlike faith and this childlike vision of Lucy to get them to see what they are supposed to do. And she's also the one that is given the gift of this little vial that heals you. That no matter what your illness is, and if you're about to die, whatever it is, whether you've been, you've been wounded in some way or you're hurt in some way, whatever it is, she has the medicine to heal you. And that is what is, is so beautiful to me about all this stuff that we're talking about. If you want to find the fountain of youth, this is it. This revelation, this idea, this story of understanding and being that childlike person, that, to me, that is the fountain of youth. That is the healing vial that of little Lucy going around to all of us wounded warriors that have tried to fight our way through the world and fight our way through all of our contradictions and fight our way through all of the turmoils and struggles of life. And here's, here's this little girl that comes with a vial of healing ointment and raises us back to life. That's, that's to me, that's, that's what your message has done to me. I think, uh, I, I think about what you said a minute ago about us being identified as sons of God. So this is this has just been on the forefront of my mind here lately, but if you only picture yourself as the adult version of the Son of God, then I think I think that's where the struggle comes in. Because it would be like let's just say that you didn't have Big Brent and Watha um as parents. Okay. Say you missed the first 15 years, and then as a 16-year-old or maybe a 25-year-old, you find out that Big Brent's your dad. It doesn't matter what happens. You're trying to go into that relationship as a grown man now. And what Christ is saying to do is we have to go into this relationship as a child. It's, it's the only way to do it. We get to relive the childhood that yes born again born from the top born born from above born from the very beginning born from the very beginning so i think we really try to become sons of god in manhood and in adulthood where it's really the childlike because i know my, i'm close to my dad and my mom because i first met them when i was unable to do anything for myself and then I grew, I grew up, and then I, every stage of the way, they were mom and dad, but the foundation of my relationship with mom and dad was based on my childhood. So we try and build our faith opposite, and we try and build this foundation as this big, strong Christian or this big, strong man, and it just doesn't work. That's where Jesus, and it's exactly the contradiction that the disciples are in when they say, who's the greatest? Yeah. It's the exact same yeah. thing. And Jesus says, well, this kid <laughs> just running by, he's the greatest. And, and and since you guys brought that up, let me just let me just what are you guys trying to get to? I guess you're trying to see who's the best man. And if uh let's see, if it's the best man, then there's none better than John the Baptist. He's probably the best born of women, but he's the uh, the least yeah. in the kingdom. And he totally, just totally shuts down that thought pattern. So I'm I'm trying to reconcile this this way of thinking that this childlike relationship with Christ 
it's it's almost as if we have to forget. <laughs> we have to forget all that we've learned. We have to tear that stuff down. So I wrote a song. Um, I don't know if, if you guys, if you're if you're watching tonight and you hadn't, I've shared it on my personal page, shared it on the church page. But I wrote a song um, since Sunday, really. I think it was Monday morning. I, I shot it to you guys, kind of based off of this message. But it's called "Wake Up, Jacob," and it just blew my mind reading through Genesis here that the constant, the constant in the story of Jacob and Joseph is the fact that Jacob continues to have to be woke up over and before Joseph ever comes into the picture. But Jacob's constant is he has to continue to be woke up. And <laughs> it's it's when Joseph is born, and I, I read this Sunday in Genesis 30, but it's when Joseph is born, jo Jacob would have been 91. He goes to Laban and tells him, I'm, I'm going to go home. I'm ready to go home. I've worked enough for you. I'm going home. And Laban, of course, coaxes six more years out of him. But it's when Joseph's born, I think something happens to Jacob. Something happens on the inside of him, and he sees the last 90 years or the last 80 years, the last 85, 90 years of strife, and he finally sees in how much he loves Joseph, he sees what he's been missing this whole time. And he says, if I can feel this way, I don't care if Esau kills me or not. I've got to go back home because I know who I am. Um, of my my uh, boss at work was telling me a story about his sons today, and they're all um, almost all graduated. Most two of them in college, one of them um, is on his way to college. I think he's a eleventh grader. But he uh, he was telling me about his sons, and when they were they were younger, he had three boys. He's got three boys, so they would fight all the time, like real real fights. But he he was talking about when they were smaller, and they like yeah boys like like real fight. So I know I've got a brother. So uh, we used to do the uh, the WWE on the trampoline and steal Dad's sun drops. We would take Dad's sun drops and pretend we were Stone Cold Steve Austin when Dad was at work, and we would shake them up and splash them together. And my dad's like, "What are y'all doing to my sun drops?" <laughs> but anyway, he was saying, "Yeah, he was saying he was not going to drink water. He still, Dad." Dad, Dad, I know you're not drinking water tonight. You're drinking sun drops to this day. Um, but my boss was telling me about his sons, and when they were when they were younger, they would they would fight with each other. And his rule, they had a big chair and a half, and a chair and a half that's a furniture term for a really big chair. It's it's they had a big chair in the living room. So when his boys would be fighting, the rule was they had to sit in that chair together and hold hands. And he would make them hold hands. That was the rule. Wow, yeah, same same instance. But he would make them hold hands. And and I and this is the first thing I hear this morning when I get to work. He's telling me the story. He said I used to make because we were talking about some things going on, and he said, I, you know, I would put my sons in that chair and make them hold hands. Well, they would sit there, and he said they would start out on each arm of the chair and they would just be holding hands and just just they'd be squeezing each other's hands as hard as they could just trying to break each other's hand he said and that would and that lasted just a few minutes he said but before you knew it when when the parents left the room you would hear them in there after about 15 minutes and they would be laughing and still holding each other's hand but that's the that's that's the kingdom though like we're trying to figure out how to do this Jesus thing as an adult, and it doesn't work. It just doesn't work. It's designed not to work. It's set up to fail. It's what took Jacob 97 years. It's set up to fail. If you try to do this in your manhood, it does not work. So he tells him, you know, tells Laban I'm ready to go back home. It takes about six more years. So I want to I want to really jump into Genesis 44 tonight and take a little bit more time than I took Sunday on this particular passage. Genesis 44 verse 12. Hope everyone at home's doing well. 
Hope you're doing great. Hope you're tracking along with us. Um, you know, we reference a lot of things we've already spoke about, so this is a good good opportunity to tell you. Any of those videos are searchable. Go through, click on videos on Facebook. You can get right up to date on our conversation right here. I know sometimes we speak, you know, just go right into it, and th all that's there for you. So take all the time you need. Go back and watch all that. But Genesis 44. So I'm not going to do all the backstory here. This is after they have met with uh, Joseph, the brothers, and uh, Judah has con Judah. No, no, I'm sorry. Benjamin was the one that Joseph was going to keep, and Simeon's the one that spoke up and said, I'll, I'll stay in his place. Judah also spoke up. They both did at the same time, but Simeon's the one that stays in the place. So Joseph is sending them back to go get who? Jacob. This is what I want you to get. It's really all about Jacob, the whole thing. So that was the punchline for the end. But anyway, we'll get to it. <laughs> so there, he sends them to go get Jacob. He hide, he has one of his servants do what? Hide the cup, hide his cup in Benjamin's bag. So when he hides his cup in Benjamin's bag, he waits till they get going, and he sends them after him. This is in verse 12 of chapter 44. So if you're following along with us, I'm going to start with verse 12. This is after Joseph's servants have already stopped his brothers before they go back to get Jacob, before they ever get too far away. They have stopped them, and they're searching through the bags. And I, I, I briefly said this, but I quoted a book. It's called Joseph's Bones, all right? Now, in this book, the author, his last name's Seagal, Jerome Seagal, I think it's the guy's name, all right? Jerome Seagal. He has quoted here that he believes that Joseph was acting as a drama counselor. A drama counselor. He was putting his brothers through a counseling session of his own journey. Okay? So you got you to gotta see this here. Benjamin's the one that's got the cup in, in his sack. All right? And they're, they're stopping and they're going through all their sacks. So we'll pick up, pick up verse 12. And he searched and began at the eldest. And left at the youngest, and the cup was found in Benjamin's sack. Now pay attention to what the brothers do here. Then they rent their clothes and laded every man his ass and returned to the city. And Judah and his brethren came to Joseph's house, for he was yet there, and they fell before him on the ground. So take this full circle. Joseph has the dream as a kid that his brothers are going to what? bow down and they could not hear it because they only seen it through his ego right. they said this is just joseph being egotistical yeah. which is exactly what religion tells you if you start wearing your robe so his brothers his brothers have 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 this took all this time for them to be able to say okay we'll fall down but this time they're falling down in what in in total despair a total despair Correct. Which brother? Benjamin. Because everything's about Jacob. Everything's about Jacob. The brothers weren't even, they weren't wailing. They weren't throwing themselves on the ground for themselves. They knew that that was the only thing keeping Jacob alive. And they're not doing it out of obeisance or worship or honor to Joseph because that's what the, yeah. that's what the mind automatically goes to. Well, you're, the, here comes this, because that's what they say when they see him afar off. They say, well, here comes this dreamer. And that's what they made fun of him about was Correct. his dream. He said, we're, we're going to bow down to you. We're going we're gonna to honor you or worship you in some way. Correct. But that's not the point. Right. They missed the point, and even Joseph maybe have missed the point right. then too. No, you're going to be pleading for the life of a lesser person. You're going to be pleading for the life of someone Correct. else because in pleading for his life, yep. you're going to save your dad. Yep. This, is how, this is how every knee will bow. Every knee will bow. And we've always been taught what's that mean. Jesus is going to make them all bow down. He's going to make them all bow down to how good he is. They're going to have to surrender. They're going to have to admit it. They're going to have to admit it, all the ones that rejected him. They're going to have to bow down. But what if Jesus is being our drama counselor? What if Jesus is being our drama counselor here, bringing us to the place to where when we bow down, we're bowing down for the lost one? 
The one, we are the ones coming to save that which was lost. We're bowing down. Oh, man. All right. I'm glad, I'm glad this is happening. This is fun. This is fun. All right. So what verse did we get to? Somebody help me. 15. All right. And Joseph said unto them after they bowed down, What deed is this that you have done? What you not that such a man as I can certainly divine? Uh, and Judah said, What shall we say unto my Lord? What shall we speak? Or how shall we wet clear ourselves? God hath found out the iniquity of thy servants. Behold, we are my Lord's servants, both we and he also with whom the cup is found. And he said, God forbid that I should do so, but the man in whose hand the cup is found, he shall be my servant. And as for you, get you up in peace and go unto your father. Then Judah came near unto him and said, O my Lord, let my servant, I pray thee, speak a word in my Lord's ears. And it's, I can just see this, man. Then Jesus, after all this time had passed, got up and told humanity, let me speak a word in your ears. Just let me speak a word in your ears. I know, man. It's just too, it's too, it's butter. It's bud. It's butter. Butter. Help me out. Where'd I get to? Where'd I get to? End of 18. All right. So I pray thee, I speak a word in my Lord's ears, and let not thine anger burn against thy servant, for thou art even as Pharaoh. My Lord has asked his servant, saying, Have ye a father or a brother? And we said unto my Lord, so what what he's doing here, what um, Judah is doing is he is bringing transparency to Joseph. He's telling the whole story. That's what Jesus does. He brings transparency to his father. He is showing us everything that we have misconceived about God. Everything. There were two covet there were two arks that traveled with the Israelites throughout the conquest out of Egypt. You only hear about one ark. You only hear about one ark, the ark of the covenant. But there was a coffin that had Joseph's bones in it. Okay? So Jesus is wanting to talk about the other ark. Jesus is pointing to Joseph over and over and over and over. Because Joseph is giving the Israelites what they couldn't even find in Yahweh because they were coming to Yahweh as men. But Joseph represents the childlike. Joseph represents the childlike that if you'll be a child, there's grace, there's forgiveness, there's healing. But if you look to this ark and you try to do this as a man, that's the point of the law. If you try to do this with your ego as a man, you're never going to get there. Ever, ever. It's always only about the child which is how we met our parents. We met our parents. We met our parents not as men. We met our parents as children. That's why we had the relationship with our parents that we had. That's why when somebody that's 30 or 40 years old for the first time meeting their real parents, it's not going to be the same relationship because they don't meet them in childlike. They don't meet them in infancy. We meet Christ in infancy. All right, let's keep going. Yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> try to meet go, him go in ahead. manhood. Try to meet him with all of our best efforts. We try to meet him with our organizations and our systematic theologies. And we try to meet him with this idea, well, all of these ideas that am I keeping a perfectly theologically accurate life? And then... We end up with all of these things. It's like me and uh, me and another brother had this conversation this past week about uh, how <laughs> when he was a kid, and uh, I was the same thing. And there was a lady that got up in church and started talking about the Harry Potter books, and it's like it's full of witchcraft. It's full of tell. These are real spells. These are real spells. Like, well, actually, it's Latin, but you know, <laughs> like okay, <laughs> maybe it is or maybe it's not. Whatever. But it's it's like you think the devil's going to jump off of you for watching those movies or watching everything else. So you meet God with all of your well. This is all of my holiness, God. I didn't watch Harry Potter this week, or I didn't I didn't turn on it back in the in the seventies or 50, whenever it was fifties. You didn't, couldn't have a television in your living rooms. It's called right. a one eyed devil. So like, well, God, I kicked the TV out of the house. So I've met you with all my holiness. I've met you with all my all the stuff that I can do. Now what, God? Now what are you going to do for me? And expecting.
thinking that I put my 25 cent in the gumball machine and expect the gumball to, to swirl right. down. It's going to be the one that I want. It's going right. to be the color and the flavor that I want. Exactly. And it's like you didn't get what you expected. Correct. You're not going to get what you expect by giving all of your best right. effort to God and giving all of the things that, that you can do as a man, everything that you can accomplish. You're not going to get what you expected out of it. Your, your salvation project, Thomas Merton said, will absolutely disappoint you because everything that you can do for God, you will find out, does not matter, does not make one hill of beans. Dung. It doesn't say to stop doing it. Doesn't say to not. It doesn't say not to give things because your labor of love is not in vain. Right. But your labor of love is not what gives you the grace of God. It's not what gives you any special uh, privilege from God right. whatsoever. Right. And that's when when you come to God, same way that you're saying here, when you come to God with all of those man-made systems, you find out it's it's not gonna it's not gonna cut it. Right. That's not what He was looking for. And it's is this on? <laughs> um, no, that's good. Uh. But, yeah, it's th- what we've been – or the way that we approach God is, like you said, as a man or, like, doing it, performing it ourselves or whatever the case may be. But it's it's with the mindset of an adopted child. You know, we and, – and we read that in the New Testament about our own adoption into the family of God, right? But we continually see ourselves as the adopted kid. We continually see ourselves as the outsider. But Paul said – when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son, this is Galatians 4, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because you are sons, God hath sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Now, that's an intimate term. That's an that's a child saying daddy daddy or however you want to say it or whatever whatever phrase you want to use but it's it's calling him father and you know adopted kids in general I'm not an adopted child so I guess I'm speaking uh, you know pre- presumptively but an adopted child or a stepchild I mean I I mean I know well okay that's a prime example so my brother and sister we have the same mother but different dads so Brad and Tad um, but they've always called my dad David, you know, I mean, for all the obvious reasons, I guess. But regardless, like with an adopted child, they would maybe call their adopted parents, you know, by their name. They wouldn't necessarily call them mom and dad unless they're very, very small. I mean, like you said, wh- if, if they meet them when they're a baby, yes. But let's just say they're 10 when they get adopted, right? They might not call them mom and dad. Or maybe 30 years from now, they might call them mom and dad or whatever. But regardless... That that I think that that's the the perception that we have of ourselves that we're this adopted child, so we're still kind of on the outside. But he says, "Wherefore thou art no more servant, but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ." I mean, that's it. You're not a servant anymore. You don't have to work for it anymore. You don't have to earn it anymore. You're just a part of the family, and because you're a part of the family, you're an heir. You've been given the title of son, daughter, whatever, uh, and you're made an heir immediately of all the things that father has. It's all yours automatically. It's beautiful. I mean, that's spot on. Spot on. Verse 19. Verse 19. My Lord. All right. So this is still Judah explaining everything to Joseph, bringing transparency to the situation. My Lord asked his servant, saying, Have you a father or a brother? And he's talking about Joseph when Joseph asked him that. And he said, And we said unto my Lord, We have a father, an old man, and a child of his old age. Three words here that change the whole story. A little one. And if you look this stuff up, scholars are going to tell you all the reasons why this says that. All right, they're gonna say um, it was it was a still a trick from Judah. Judah was trying. That doesn't even make sense because Jude, Benjamin's already with them. That's that doesn't even make sense. So so he is literally still referring to Benjamin as a little one because he's and he's gonna tell you exactly why he was a little one to his father. All right, but then he says and his brother is dead, but he's talking to his brother Caden. He's talking to Joseph. He said, but his brother's dead, but he's talking to his brother. All right, but his 
but his brother is dead, and he alone is left of his mother, and his father loveth him. And thou saidst unto thy servants, Bring him down unto me, that I may set my eyes upon him. And when and we said unto my Lord, The lad cannot leave his father. For if he should leave his father, his father would die. And thou saidst unto thy servants, Except your youngest brother come down with you, you shall see my face no more. And it came to pass when we came up unto thy servant, my father, we told him the words of my Lord. And our father said, Go again and buy us a little food. And we said, We cannot go down. If our youngest brother be with us, then we will go down. For we may not see the man's face except our youngest brother be with us. And thy servant, my father, said unto us, You know that my wife bare me two sons. And the one went out from me, and I said, Surely he is torn in pieces, that I saw him not since. And if ye take this also from me, and mischief befall him, you shall bring down my gray hairs with sorrow to the grave. Now, therefore, when I come to thy servant, my father, and the lad be not with us, seeing that his life is bound up in the lad's life. That's it. Jacob's life was bound up in Benjamin. Jacob's life was bound up in Joseph. They are what caused him to wake up because all of the other boys represent the strife of man. All of the other boys born from Rachel or born from Leah, born from Bilhah, born from Zilpah, all those boys to Jacob represented Jacob's 91 years of strife. But Joseph represents Jacob's childlike. Jacob realizing in his old age that I didn't have to do all this for all these years. Okay, so Judah says, if I take him away, Benjamin away, he's going to die because his life is in him. All right. All right, verse 31. It shall come to pass when he seeth that the lad is not with us that he will die. And thy servant shall bring down the gray hairs of thy servant our father with sorrow to the grave. For thy servant became surety for the lad unto my father, saying, If I bring him not unto thee, then I shall bear the blame to my father forever. Now, therefore, I pray thee, let thy servant abide instead of the lad a bondman to my Lord, and let the lad go up with his brethren. Here it is. For how shall I go up to my father and the lad be not with me? (laughs) How can I go to my father if the childlike isn't with me? How can I see God for who he is if the childlike is not with me? Lest peradventure I see the evil that shall come on my father. And then jump into 45. Then Joseph could not refrain himself before all them that stood by him, and he cried. Because every cause cause every man to go out from me, and there stood no man with him. While Joseph made himself known unto his brethren, and he wept aloud, and the Egyptians and the house of Pharaoh heard. And Joseph said unto his brethren, I am Joseph, doeth my father yet live. And his brethren could not answer him, for they were troubled at his presence. All right, so so we won't go too far into that right there. But here's the key. I want you to see this, this here. When Judah tells Jacob, before they've brought Benjamin back to Joseph, when Judah tells Jacob that we have to take Benjamin, all right, Jacob is holding on to Benjamin for dear life. But Judah knew that it takes the son. He's bringing Joseph, Benjamin to Joseph because Joseph asked. But Joseph knew that it takes the child to move anything. It takes the child to move anything. If you're going to go on a journey, it's going to be as a child. So the journey couldn't happen until Benjamin was allowed to go. And, ba- and Benjamin represented the childlike. The journey couldn't have ever, didn't even start for Joseph or Jacob to go back home until Joseph was born. So it's the child that always causes the needle to move. It's the child is the catalyst for us to take the journey. And this true journey into Christ doesn't start until it's the childlike that's moving within you. That's the only way the child... Go ahead, Michael. I know you got something. You you look like you got your mic ready. 
Okay, all right. So the child, the the childlike is the only thing that causes the journey. And here's the and here's why. Here's why. Because childlike is the state of discovery. Childlike is the state of discovery. That's why life gets so boring and mundane the older you get. The older you get, the more boring life gets. And the reason for that is, as you were a child, everything was interesting. As you watch, as I watch little Marshall play on the floor at home, everything he touches is the most amazing thing he's ever picked up. Everything. If he picks up the remote, he is looking at it. He's laying hold of it. He's touching it. But as we get old, we get used to everything. When you first, when you first experience the first, the first time that you hit a home run, the first time that you score a basketball, it, it's the first time, but every time it gets a little less because what? You've done it before. You've grown. You've grown. You've grown. You've grown. So it's the same principles when we start a new job. It's our first day full of expectancy because we start our first job we start our jobs in really a childlike manner most people do most people do when when they're, when they're going into a new job that is very childlike they're going to go into it expecting anything totally wide open and that's what Joseph knew had to happen and that and I think that's why he broke I think that's why he finally lost it because he saw Judah speak up and say I will stay here because jo because Benjamin is the only thing keeping Jacob alive. Go ahead. Judah does the same thing that the prodigal son does. The prodigal son has his rehearsed speech to give to his father and says, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Let me be a servant. And Judah immediately offers to Joseph, let me be a servant on behalf of the boy. And that way we're just even Stephen. This whole thing can just go away. I'll be your servant forever, and all of this madness, all this, con all this stuff can just go away. And that's the part that breaks Joseph. And that's the part that Jesus says breaks the father. The father sees the son coming afar off, and before he can even get the first line of his rehearsed speech out, the father just falls on his neck, hugs him, and embraces him, and brings him in. Right. And this, the, this idea is like, no, I'm your brother. Mm -hmm. I'm not, you're not, mm -hmm. I'm not your Lord. Mm -hmm. I, it was never meant for you to bow down and worship me. Right. It was never meant for you to do any of that, to serve me or anything. It was always meant for me to be your brother. Right. Don't, right. don't offer me servanthood. Don't offer me obeisance. Don't offer me anything right. like that. Just offer me your brotherhood. Correct. Well, it's the only thing. Okay. So you can't forget this either. Benjamin had 10 sons. He was 35 years old, most likely. And we told y'all that we would answer this on Wednesday night because we were talking about how old Benjamin would have been when Joseph was sold into slavery. Benjamin would have most likely been 10 years old when Joseph was sold into slavery, which means now as Jacob is screaming at Judah saying, you're not taking Benjamin. He's my little baby boy. But Benjamin has 10 sons. Benjamin is a grown man. So I say, I echo again. Can we come to God as children? Benjamin is the answer. Go ahead. Yeah, I think that you said a couple of things in there that are really, really good as far as the, you know, the childlike, especially the curiosity piece, right? Because Jill, the, the children are genuinely curious. And, and like you said, they're, they're interested in, in the things that they're encountering because they, this is the first time they've encountered it. You know, so for us to see certain things or to experience certain things, it's like, nah, whatever. Right? I've already had that. But it's like the first time you give your kid chocolate ice cream. Like, they're, they're you know, like, I, I, you see these videos on, online sometimes, you know, of kids' faces or whatever. And it looks like their brain literally exploded. Their eyes are bugging out of their head. You know, they're, they're clamoring for the spoon or whatever. But uh, it, it's, it's this genuine still curiosity. <laughs> yeah, I know. Still do it. <laughs> Uh, genuine curiosity, you know, but, and, and, and I can even remember, and this is, this is something that, golly, I mean, this, all this just floods back so many memories, but I remember going to see the, uh, I think it was the Lord of the Rings, actually, um, the, when it first came out, the first movie in theaters, and 
Um, I was probably 14, something like that, 13, 14, somewhere in there. And um, <laughs> I forget I forget what it was, but, you know, somebody had said something about oh, these are evil, you know, these are, these are evil films, you know, wizardry and all this kind of stuff, you know. And, and I had said something about that to my dad, and he was like, really? <laughs> He's like, uh, do you know anything about C.S. Lewis? You know, <laughs> and I'm like, uh, I mean, uh, Tolkien, J.R. Tolkien, sorry. Uh, we were talking about Lewis earlier. But, um, yeah, they were buddies. <laughs> but do you know anything about Tolkien? Like, no. <laughs> you know, so, of course, that sends me down the path of learning about him. And so we go see that first film, and it was epic, obviously. But I remember sitting in the theater, and we got popcorn and Coke or whatever. And I just remember glancing over at one point, and I, I think about this often, but I remember glancing over, and my dad's just eating popcorn, you know. And it was like, it hit me. Like, it, my dad's always loved popcorn. Like, microwave popcorn, movie popcorn, whatever, you know, just, but bring it on. Sunday nights was like popcorn, you know. We get home from church, everybody's eating some kind of snack. Usually dad was popping a, a bag of popcorn and drinking a Coke, right? Caffeine free. Uh, so, <laughs> but we're, <laughs> like, he's he's eating that popcorn, and it just, just, you know, punch me right in the in the gut, and maybe not so much then, but now, uh, thinking back on it, that he was a child. He was getting to do something that he got to do as a child, but it was a privilege. It was something that you know they didn't necessarily get to do often, and he can probably recount you you know the 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 first time he ever went to the movies and got popcorn and all that kind of stuff or whatever, because that was just it was just new to them, right? And right. so, but but it just hit me that you know he got he gets to live in this, in this childlike state for you know even if it's just for an hour and a half or two hours, ever how long this movie is, you know, getting to watch the film, e- eat the popcorn, and enjoy the moment, whatever. But it 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 took him. I'm sure it takes him back to those times, you know, that he 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 goes right back to that in his mind. Yeah. And it's like you know, for me even watching watching my kids, you know, grow up, like you said. I mean, especially with Harmony, she's she's three going on four, and so she's curious about everything, right? And and she's at the age now where she's a little more standoffish, like she's you know she's sort of scared of some things or whatever, but she's still genuinely curious, and she wants to know, and she'll ask questions, and she'll try to explore, and she'll try to do things on her own or whatever. And it's like that genuine curiosity is how we have to approach God, right? And how we have to approach this thing called the kingdom. And and when we don't approach it like that, and I'll tell you the other thing, the other part of that is gratitude. There is a there is an element of gratitude to everything that children experience because they've never experienced and it's and it's like, oh my gosh, you're giving me this thing and it's like whatever it is, maybe it's a delicious food or they just have a fun experience in a game or or whatever that they've never gotten to do or never gotten to play and it was like Oh my God! And you know how it is with kids. This was so much fun. It's like, well, we got to stop playing now. And it's like, oh my gosh, what? Why do we have to stop? But it's it's that you know, just just super. I mean, just sold out on the whole thing, right? It, but there is a level of gratitude, and it's like, oh man, I'm, I, you can just see that they're so thankful they're getting to partake in this right. thing. And it's like that's the other element that we have to approach the kingdom with is right. that not just genuinely curious about God, I feel the Holy Ghost is thinking about what could what could possibly happen here what are the possibilities because Jesus said you'll do greater things than the things you've seen me do and it and it's like when you think about that and you think about going into a situation whatever it may be and it's like if I'm going into it with my father as his son because that's the only way that Jesus is referenced right, right. the son of God if I'm going into it as his son what are the possibilities once I get my hands on this right, thing. right, and and then on top of that, having the the thankfulness, the gratitude to be able to say, I get to be a part of this. This is this is amazing. This is phenomenal. Thank you so much, God. Thank you so much, Father, right. that I get to partake in this. I get to participate with this. I mean, Jesus says some of those same things. You know, thank you that you've hidden this from men, right? But you've shown it to the yeah. to the little ones. Yeah, the least you hid it from the wise and yes. the prudent. Yes. And revealed it unto babes. Unto babes, unto children. Because babes, everything is significant. Yes, and that's it. And that's it. And they're and they're they're grateful for it. Yes. They're they're 
And there's tons of research out there now that proves that simply being grateful for things in your life or whatever totally improves your mental wellness. Correct. Your, your mental health will skyrocket into, you know, well, or whatever. It'll just pull you out of a depression right. if you just take the, take the time to be mindful of the things that you, the, the things that you have or the, 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 the privileges that you have or whatever it may be, wh- whether that's having all of your bodily functions work like they're supposed to, having all of your limbs, having all, both of your eyes, being able to hear, being able to speak, uh, you know, being able to taste the food that you eat, being able to breathe on your own health, you know, all that stuff, having a job to go to every day, having a house to live in, having a family to be a part of, whatever it is. And, and then the list goes on and on and on of things that we have, but you always have something to be grateful for, even if it's just the fact that I am alive in this moment. Right, right now, I just I'm, I get to be here. And it's like that, you know, you, you said it, uh, mm-hmm. Sunday, you were talking about being present, and it it's is. like yeah. now is a gift. That's yeah. why they call it the present. Yeah. You know, like it's actually today, but but now is a gift. Mm-hmm. That's why it's called a present, and we should be thankful. We should yeah. be grateful. And when we approach the things of God, or the things of our Father, with gratitude, yeah, it just makes the experience that much greater. Right. This is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice. And be glad in it. And that's not just something we quote to put us in a better mood. That is something that we say, today is the day that the Lord has made, and I'm in it. So with a child, everything is significant, even the least significant things to us. It's why Creed, it's why Melody picked up the pepper grinder. And the pepper grinder seemed so insignificant, but it became uber significant. That's why Joseph talked to a baker and a cupbearer about something that he could have easily said was totally insignificant. Why would he be talking to the, he knows who he is, but that's the thing that sets Joseph apart is he never questioned any of it. He he never became cynical in right. the middle of his suffering, knowing that he was there unjustly, knowing that he did not deserve to right. be there. He didn't say, you know, I don't give a crap about your right. stupid dreams. Right. I'm going to sit over here and sulk. Right. I'm going to sit over here and pity because I don't belong here anyway. So you guys can go and do whatever in the world you want to do. I'm just going to sit over here to myself. So it was the care of Joseph to walk up and to ask the butler and the cupbearer, why are you sad? Why are you sad? If he wouldn't have cared, if he wouldn't have cared, the entire world would not have seen the salvation that came through Joseph. If he, if he, listen, this is, this is how significant it is. He's in jail. In our circumstance, in a man's world, can't get no worse. You know, that's rough. That's rough, man. I mean, he's in jail. He could have been sulking. He could have been worrying. He could have been pity party time. But he walks by a butler and a cupbearer, and they're sad. And they weren't even talking about anything. They, they, he, they didn't even say anything to him. He said, what's wrong with you? Why are you sad? And sometimes that's all you need to do to change somebody's life. When you walk by them at work, when you walk by them at home, and you walk by them in the street, or you walk by them wherever you see them at, and you know that they are not having the same countenance that they usually do. You change their life when you ask them the simple question, are you okay? Are you okay? You're not acting like yourself. You're not acting like I know you're supposed to act. Something's wrong with you. It's because you're starting to take care of your brother. You're starting to take care of those that you're surrounded with. And because Joseph did not see himself above the circumstance, he saw the insignificant in our eyes, insignificant, as the most significant. And he asked the cupbearer, what's wrong with you? He asked, he asked the butler, what's wrong with you? And he interpreted their dreams. And then that led to what? Being in front of Pharaoh, which also led to him becoming Zaphnath Paneah, which also led to his brothers coming back. And the whole thing that Joseph longed for was the relationship with his brothers. And he got to have it. So 
You got something else? Yeah, let me Go say ahead. One thing. So this is a quote from Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. So always hold fast to the present. Every situation, indeed, every moment is of infinite value, for it is the representative of a whole eternity. That's, yeah. <laughs> always hold fast to the present. Every situation, indeed, every moment is of infinite value, for it is the representative of a whole eternity. Now, wow. there's, there's a principle in quantum physics that every molecule is connected to every other molecule and that it has this eternal or universal, and I mean like across the universe, not like universal whatever, you know, not like universal remote. I'm talking about across the universe, all these things are connected. Everything is like there's a realm that we can't see with our eyes, right, when we talk about quantum physics. There's a movie coming out. Uh, I was going to say, I, it, it is, it is. Uh, there's a new Ant-Man movie coming out or whatever that's supposed to dive a little quantum mania. Okay, well, it's it's supposed to dive. All Rudd. All Rudd's in it. Yeah, right. he's he's good. That's about the only reason I watch it. But he, uh, they, they, they're taking a little deeper dive into the, you know, the, the quantum realm, right? And it's like, it, it's this, it's this space in between all the spaces, right? And so, but there's, there's something going on there at that very mi super microscopic, whatever, you know, to the tenth, to the nth degree microscopic level that is connected. And it's like. It, I mean, like you said, if if he had not walked by it, I mean, if he had not noticed when he walked by, you know, that these guys were sad and just asked the question. And sometimes it's as simple as that, right? It's That's the thing they teach you in sales, right? If you don't ask for it, you're not going to get it, right? You'll never get it. Because the things that are seen are temporal. Things that are not seen are eternal. Yes, right? yes, right. So, but but I just think that the, the connection to everything, like you said, just – it's a part of every, it's a part of the eternal. Absolutely. So let's get let's get into the wake up the the actual reason I call this wake up Jacob. All right, because that's that's where I want to get to. Verse 25 of chapter 45. If you're following along with us, we're in Genesis 45 and we're going to start at verse 25 and this is when the boys are going home to get Jacob. And they finally get there and they say they went up out of Egypt and came into the land of Canaan unto jo jo Jacob, their father. Sorry, I'm a little excited. Verse 26, and told him, saying, Joseph is yet alive, and he is governor all over all the land of Egypt. And Jacob's heart fainted, for he believed them not. They said, Joseph is yet alive. And he is governor over all the land of Egypt. And Jacob's heart fainted, for he believed them not, because he was talking to men. He was talking to men. It was the men's words that he didn't believe. Verse 27, and they told him all the words of Joseph, which is still his little boy, which he said unto them, and when he saw the wagon, which Joseph had sent to carry him, the spirit of Jacob their father revived. And Israel said, It is enough. Joseph, my son, is yet alive. I will go see him before I die. Jacob woke up. Why? How? Not when the men were talking. Not when the boys were talking. Not when they told him Joseph is still alive. None of that moved Jacob at all. But when he looked out his front door and he saw the chariots, he saw the childlike give him a ride, one more journey back into the truth. The childlike that he saw when Joseph was born, the childlike that he saw when Joseph, when Joseph was born and he went up to Laban, it was the courage to go up to Laban and say, I'm ready to go back home. When he saw those chariots, that same thing happened to him because Joseph sent the chariots. Joseph sent the chariots. The child sent the chariots. So I'm telling you, men, there is a chariot waiting for you that is sent by God. And the only way to go into this life with Christ, the only way to see the Father is to get on the chariot that the child has sent. Because Joseph was still the child. 
Benjamin was still the child. Benjamin had ten sons for crying out loud. And Joseph sent the chariots, and Je- and Jacob said, "I'm all right." So then, but then look at the beauty the beauty of the King James right here. I know I'm I'm critical sometimes of the King James, and it's not it is not because it lacks poetry. That is not at all why I'm critical of the King James. The King James is is very beautifully written. It just lacks some of the uh, some. Of, it's got a lot of biases. We won't go too far down that road. That's that's, that's the best way to say it. Verse uh, verse twenty seven. And they told him all the words of Joseph, which he had said unto them. And when he saw the wagons which Joseph had sent to carry him, the spirit of Jacob, their father, revived. And Israel said, it is enough. Joseph, my son, is yet alive. I will go and see him before I die. But here's the other thing. Jacob woke up when he realized that Joseph not only was alive, but he sent him a ride. Joseph sent him a ride. And jo- Joseph was sending him, sending him those chariots because he wanted to see his father. What did I say at the very beginning of this? Everything was about Jacob. It was all about Jacob. And I think that's what turns his heart because he's sitting there at however old he is now, a hundred a hundred and however, 120, I mean, way up there. And his life has been so, he's lived a short, hard life, is the way he says it to Pharaoh. I've lived a short, hard life, you know. We would say 120 or 30 years is a, is a long, crazy, unbelievable life. But Jacob's saying, I've lived a short, hard life. And he's looking back through all these setbacks and all these failures and all the way back to Esau all the way back to his father Isaac and all the stuff he's tried to do just to get somebody to say, come and be with me. Just for Isaac to say, come and be with me. Just for whoever, all these things, just anybody. He's looking for anybody to say, come and be with me. And it's Joseph that sends the chariot. It's Joseph, it's the child that sends the chariot and says, Dad, I just want to see you. It's all about you. I'm sending the chariots for you. And in that moment, Israel spoke. Jacob saw the chariots, but Israel spoke. And and I want I do want to say this before we, before I, I'm I'm just about wrapped up with everything I want to say. But there this is something that Damon Thompson says all the time. There is no tribe of Joseph. There is no tribe of Joseph. There's no tribe of Joseph. Je- Damon Thompson says this all the time. There's all these tribes. E- every other son gets a tribe. Joseph doesn't have, have a tribe. Who has the tribes? Manasseh, Ephraim, if, Ephraim, and Manasseh. Because of what? There Joseph is again pointing to what? The children. Continuing to point to the child. The childlike sends the chariot. And it's our decision to get in it or not. It's our decision to get in it or not. And the present is the present. The present is the present. Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. How is he the same yesterday, today, and forever? Because he's present. He's in the now. He's in the now. It's what you're talking about with, with the quantum physics. It's it's right now. This is the only thing, the only thing I can right now in my life, Caden, I can't do anything I can't do anything about what's happening in Charlotte right now. But this water bottle, I can take a hold of it. Because this is the moment I'm in. And this is the only moment that you can be present with God in. Because when you realize that you are in this moment, and you are as alive as anything has ever been, it's in this moment that you see that God is not calling you his grown man's son. He's calling you. His little boy. And he's saying, have a relationship with me. Be my son. You always have been. You always will be. You don't have to work at it. It's why Jacob made the coat. It's why he made Joseph the coat. Because you don't have to work at it, son. You don't have to earn it. And Joseph lives out the life that Jacob set up for him. And he's repaid by the chariots coming. Now, here's the here's the... Here's the thing I've thought about, too. Even to the very end of Jacob's life, 
the last gesture he makes is the crossed hand blessing. Okay? Now, I get it. He's pointing to the child life. I get it. But he's also, also kind of looking back to what? I was the little one. I was the child. I was the youngest. I was the youngest. And and it's just so it's so uh, amazing that there's all these references. Go ahead. So he's pointing back to because Joseph yeah. does it. Joseph was the youngest. You back up to his dad. He's the second born, gets the birthright. You back up to his dad. He wasn't the first born of Abraham. It was Ishmael. And and uh, and his dad is the one that gets the birthright. Right. And so he's he's making a statement here that God's been doing this this whole time. Right. I'm just going to join in with what God has done. Right. I'm going to join in with the same thing that's been happening this whole time. Right. I'm just going to do what he's doing. <laughs> Correct. Correct. And how fitting is it that Jesus' dad yeah. is named Joseph. And Joseph's dad is named Jacob. Jesus' grandpa was named Jacob <laughs> on Joseph's side. All right. And then as and then and then here's the other beautiful part of it. Joseph asked the Israelites to what? Carry his carry my bones out. Take them out of Egypt. I don't because Egypt became what? After that's what religion is. After a while, re, after salvation, if you stay there too long, if you stay there too long, if you don't remain present, what saved you becomes what traps you. And that's what Egypt becomes. But Joseph tells him what? When I die, I know I'm about to die, but, you know, whenever y'all get up out of Egypt, I don't belong here, so take my bones with you. How, how amazing is it that Joseph of Arimathea is the one that gets the body of Jesus? I mean, it's all these point, these indicators back to Joseph. All of them point back to this Jacob-Joseph relationship. And everything changed when Jacob looked in Joseph's eyes and went to Laban and said, I'm ready to go home. Now, now, of course, six more years passed. But everything changed when he looked at Laban and said, I'm ready to go home. Because the child was born, the Israel was born in that moment. I know that it didn't come out until he was a God contender. It didn't come out, you know, he didn't get the title until he until he, he wrestled with God or wrestled with an angel, wrestled with whatever we want to say it is. I'm so tired of debating which one it is. It doesn't matter. All I know is Jacob left not Jacob anymore. He left Israel. But the seed of that was when Joseph was born. When Joseph was born, something changed in that man that he had carried for 91 years. And it was the act of trying to earn it as a man. And you can't, you just can't. You have to be the child. And the child gets to wear the garment. The child gets to put on the coat. The child gets to sink down and in to the chariots <laughs> that are going to take you on a journey. Look at it, Abraham. Abraham sees God as father. And he goes on the journey. The journey only happens when you're a child and you say, everything's significant. Everything's significant. You're going to go home tonight. You're going to brush your teeth. You're going to get in the bed. You're going to turn your light off. And it's not going to be just another night. It's significant. Because you know what's with you in every one of those moments? Abba. In every moment. When you pick up your toothbrush in the morning, Abba's with you. In that present. In that moment. When you're on your way to work, Abba's with you. And if we can see our life as that significant, we'll be able to hear the butler. We'll be able to look at the butler. That, that is the stepping stone. We'll be able to look at the cupbearer. That's the stepping stone. Not just for you, for the world. This is the world. This is how we inherit the earth. The only way we inherit the earth is taking care of our brothers, taking care of our Jacobs, taking care of our fathers, taking care of our brothers, our sisters, our mothers. All right, I'm 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 gonna shut up. I'm gonna shut up. You got anything else? Go ahead. I've always I've always loved the stories of, of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. I've always found a lot of significance in them. But the thing is that with it's like what you're saying, when the idea of being Israel was born, it's when he crosses over a Ford Jabok, which means to pour out. So he he it could be said that he pours out the being of Jacob pours out all of the trying, all of the efforts, and all the lies, all the deceit. 
pours all that out and there wrestles he a man. And like I said, no identity of who this person is. It just seems like it's someone that's divine or at least has the ability to give him something that he wants. Give him something that he's desiring. And he gives him this identity of, of being no longer called Jacob, but you're called Israel now because you've wrestled with God and you've prevailed. And so it makes him a prince. And then leaves there, but he, before he leaves, he calls the place Penel, which is the face of God, because I've seen the face of God. So even he's able to identify it that way. And then he goes and he sees his brother whom he's betrayed, and his brother sees that he sees the face of God, that they see the face of God within each other when they see each other and, see and feel grace. And then you get to this, you know, back to this point now where he's, he's left Laban, he's finally able to move on, with his life, Joseph is born, and he be really thinks that, you know, I'm, I'm going to be the thing, I'm going to be the one that God's called me to be. And we do that so often, like, you know, things are starting to take off for me. I got a good job, got a ministry or whatever it is, whatever whatever's going right in your life, anything that's going right in your life. And as soon as everything starts going right in your life, you end up with a situation where everything starts going bad. Not, and, it's, and I'm not saying that it's just always going to be that way, but sometimes it just happens. Sometimes something really, really bad happens that you were not expecting. You weren't anticipating life to turn out like this. And then the idea of being the prince of God, it dies. So with Jacob, when he hears that his favorite son, that, that the son Joseph is dead, ripped up by a lion, and the coat that he gave him to, signi to, to signify that this was his favorite son, and that he was going to be different. That Joseph, you're going to be better than me. You're not going to have to grow up and wonder who you are. You're not going to have to wrestle with God. You're not going to have to wrestle with your past. You're not going to have to wrestle with your demons. You're not going to have to wrestle with everything that burdens you. Or you're not going to have to do the things that I had to do. You're just going to be free. You're born free. And the son that was born free is now dead in his mind. And he's lost everything that he believes in. So now if he's dead, what's the point of me living? What's the point of going on? Because the whole idea of me being Israel was for Joseph to be free, to be born free. And then once he finds out that Joseph is alive, it's, it says right here that Jacob, their father, revived. The word is the exact same word that's used throughout all of the book of Genesis where it says that Adam lived so many years, Methuselah lived this many years, and Enoch lived this many years. It's, it, that it's their Jacob, their father, lived. But it's also the exact same word that's at the end of the book of Job, where Job goes through everything that he suffers, loses everything that he loves, everything that he holds dear, everything that he values, and everything that the, that the Scripture said that he was afraid to lose. That the thing that he feared most had come upon him. But by the time you get to the end of that story, it says, and lived Job, that revived Job. Job is now alive after he's put God on trial, after he's suffered everything that he's gone through, after he has, has dealt with the, the struggles and the trials of his life and all of the contradictions that are therein. And he realizes that there's nothing that I could have done about any of those things. Well, there's everything that I was holding on to with white knuckle grip that I was trying to hold and do my best with to contend with, with myself. I couldn't hold on to it. I couldn't keep it. I couldn't make my own salvation. I couldn't make my own life. And once he releases that and releases even those that had cursed him, cursed him while he was suffering, the guys that kicked him while he was down, and it says that after he prays for them, after he forgives them, after he does this, it says that the suffering of Job was turned. Uh, everything that was happening to Job was turned after he got offers forgiveness and love to the people that had done him wrong. The same way that this, this thing happens with Joseph, that Joseph forgives his brothers, and as they're bowing down to him, not bowing down, I, I can't get all, I'm, I'm not going to get away from that because that, just, that hit me tonight. That was revelation. That his brothers aren't bowing down to him out of obeisance or out of an offering of giving their life to him. That was missing the point from the very get-go. That was missing the whole entire interpretation of the dream. For Joseph to be an interpreter of dreams, I don't think he, inter he did not give the interpretation of that dream. He didn't offer, <clears throat> offer that one. It's not bowing down in servitude. It was bowing down for the least of these, 
It was bowing down the same way that Jesus said, when you've done it to the least of these, you've done it unto me. Now, when the whole world bows down at the name of Jesus, it's bowing down saying, Lord, will you save even the least of these? Can you help me do it to the least of these? Give me the strength or give me whatever it is that I need to do to offer love and life and help to the very least of these, my brethren. And that's what it was with Joseph. He didn't want to be their Lord. He wanted to be their brother the whole time. And it's the same thing with Jesus. Jesus does not want to be your Lord. He wants to be your brother, that he's a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. And in Hebrews, it says that he was not ashamed to call us his brethren. And the word Adelphos means of the same womb. It's the Greek word that's used. It's we are of the exact same womb as Jesus. And if you take that to Revelation 1, it says that Jesus was the first begotten of the dead, which meant that he took the grave that he was placed in of Joseph of Arimathea and turned the grave into a womb and was born out of death. And of that same death, we were all born. When he was crucified, we were crucified. When he was buried, we were buried. And when he rose, we all rose out of the same tomb that was technically really at that point not just a tomb but it was a womb that was giving birth to something that was far greater than anything that we could imagine it was the sonship of being just a just being a little son of God not being the big bad man of God not being the powerful man of God of miracles or all the other stuff that we try to build our temples around and our sanctuaries around the way that Peter did on the top of the mountain let's build a tabernacle for this one and that one we're not doing any of that just being the sons of God and when you bring it back to that that Benjamin is the one that is keeping Jacob alive but it's Joseph that revives Israel Benjamin is the son of the, it, I think he means the son of my left hand. So he's literally got now a full embrace. As the son of his left hand and the son of his right hand of Joseph, now you've not just got something that, you know, we, we, we use that a lot, especially in uh, dominance cultures where we talk about, you know, the, who gets the blessing, how they are blessed, blessed with the right hand or the left hand or whatever it is. But really, I think that you have to see it less from that perspective and more from the perspective of an embrace now. And an embrace of everything that you are. If it was Benjamin that was keeping him alive, that's keeping Jacob alive. That's keeping all of the deceit. That's keeping all the darkness. That's keeping all the things that he wants to even get himself away from. That's keeping at least that part of me alive. And even if it is dark, even if it is something that I do not want to be, at least I'm alive. At least I'm living, even if I'm not living the life that I want to live. But it's when he understands or when he sees that Joseph is alive, and now he's got this right-hand son. Now it's a full embrace of everything that he is. It's an embrace of his dark side and his light side. It's an embrace of everything that he could have ever become. And now here's his fullness. And now I'm no longer going to live as Jacob. I can live as the prince. Israel is alive. Israel lived. He revived when he said, and Israel said it is enough, literally could be translated to say the same thing that Jesus said, that it is finished. It's all, it gives the idea of perfection, that for it, something is brought to completion, that something is finished. That, that's what he says. And Israel said, it is enough. Joseph, my son, is yet alive. I will go and see him before, my, before I die. Israel said, as the, and that, man, it's like you said, the, the poetry that's here in these two verses, it's which Joseph had sent to carry him, and the spirit of Jacob, their father, revived, and Israel said, it is finished. <laughs> it's complete. My life is now, everything is perfect now. That's, just, that's beautiful. If, if, if you're looking for that completion, you're seeking that completion, there, there's no seeking. There's no chasing after it. For one, I think that it's just a, and again, it, not, not to even put a, a, a certain term on it to say that it's something you have to do. I think that it's all in the receiving. It's all in the, the same way that Jesus received the child, and he said if you receive the childlike, you receive one of these little ones, you are receiving me. So receiving it, it's, it's that same idea of being childlike and what Michael was saying, being a kid that receives something and they receive it with gratitude because it's something that they've never experienced before. Even, and I, I mean, 
I'm I'm no Michael is a cook. I I'm I'm I I put stuff in the pan. I'm not that. I, there's certain things that I cook that I'm I'm okay at. But like the girls love it when I make tacos. You know how to do it. There's no secret to it, and they know that there's no secret. They know they know everything. They could do it themselves. It's it's like there was a TikTok a while back. And it was like ground beef from the grocery store. I mean, it's <laughs> tortilla from the grocery store. I mean, as it get everything from the grocery, there's nothing Hispanic. There's nothing remotely culturally accurate about anything that I'm doing. All I'm doing, I'm getting ground beef. I get the Lauren gets the uh, wh- what's that? What's that El Paso box that has the uh, has the tortillas in there? It has the mix, uh, and you put that in there with a little bit of water, and you seasons up the meat. To them, that's the best meal they've ever had. Every single time we have it, get the shredded cheese from the, you know, it, we're not shredding cheese. It's just, it's just the, you know, the dried up shredded cheese, the craft or what. Probably not even. Actually, we don't even get the craft. We get the food line or Walmart brand, whatever is there. It's on sale that week. We get that shredded cheese. They don't even put any other sauce in it. Well, however, the meat is. That's just, that's just the way they want it. Meat and cheese. The best meal that they've ever had, and they ask for it every single night, every night. At least we some usually get it to them on Tuesday, but Taco Tuesday. But it's to them that is all that they want. And when they get when they get off school, when they get out of school, or I get off work and I go and pick them up, and, and I'm just like, they're like, well, what do we have for supper today? And I say, well, you know, Monday it's like meat roast. Okay, we're gonna have tacos. <laughs> I mean, they they want because that's what they want. And but if you give it to them, they're so grateful and they're joyous over something that is as simple and nowhere. It's not complex. It takes two minutes to cook that meal. It doesn't take any time at all to throw that together. It's just you cook one thing. It's just the meat. But they're appreciative and they enjoy it because it's something that they want. And most of the people would say, "Oh, it's because they're spoiled." And it's like, no. I mean, they're legitimately appreciative because they want it. And it was, you know, same thing that my parents said because I was an only child about being spoiled. It was like, well, we only have we only have him once. He's only a kid once. <laughs> so, I mean, if if you want to call that being spoiled, okay, whatever. They're only a kid once, and it's like Jordan Peterson said, you only have little kids for four years. When they're four, w- once they reach four or five years old, they entire they change a little bit, and then from five to adolescence. Then they then they hit another change. Then from adolescence on, they hit another change. Then all of a sudden, it's like Josh sent us this video today. Then all of a sudden, you you have this adult that walks out of your house, and they're none of those kids anymore, unless you've taught them to be childlike, unless you've led them to this, unless you've led them to this place, and you're you're being like Jacob was with Benjamin. That your life is tied to that, and if it's bound up, if my life is bound to them being my children. How beautiful of a life is that to live, that my life as an adult is bound to my children being children, even if they're 35 years old and have 11 kids, or 10, 10 sons, however many that Benjamin has. He's a little one. He's a my, my father's an old man, but there's a, there's a little one. There's a ch- He has a son. He has a lad, a little one. He talked about those tacos. I remember my papa, my papa used to make something called a papa special. You know what it was? A grilled cheese sandwich. And I had no idea until I got older that the whole universe knew what a grilled cheese sandwich was. I thought it was his own recipe. I thought it was something I thought it was something that he designed just for us that like he he and that's what your girls are doing. And it's not about the, oh, this is the incarnation, man. This is communion. This is the body of our Lord Jesus. It's because your daughters see you in it, man. And it's their favorite thing, and daddy's making it for them. And it's because my papa made me something that was special for me. And that's what all this is about. And Jesus is the manifestation of God himself, Abba, coming down into your small little world, into your little playground, and saying, you want to play? And then I wanted to say this as far as um, Jesus, Jesus being so connected to Joseph. There's nobody else in the Bible like him. And I, and I want to pitch that book again. It's called Joseph's Bones, Joseph's Bones by Jerome Siegel. Not sure if it's Steven Seagal's brother or not. Um, it could be. I have not done the research, but it could be Steven Seagal's brother that wrote that book. It may not be, but it may be. 
So read that book. But I, I wanted to say that I, I wanted to throw that last pitch in there because that that book gets you thinking thoughts that you know church kids would get in trouble for thinking because they're they're they make you challenge what you believe, and that's the journey. That's Welcome the journey. to the Gathering Echo. Yeah. That's what we do pretty much all the time. <laughs> We're over here talking about Zen Buddhism and the Bhagavad Gita, and you don't often hear that in uh, Christian churches. But uh, welcome to New Testament. So if you want to hear about stuff like that, come and join us. We talk about everything and believe that it all points to Jesus. So anything else? I'm done. My heart's clear. Good. Well, um, there's something that Michael said about being that child and having the vision for discovery, and I hope that this opens up your mind and your vision, and now you're able to see not with the human eyes, but you're able to see by faith, you're able to see by the Spirit that there's something that is far more significant about you, that you really, truly matter, and that we love you, that God loves you, and we can understand his love because he first loved us. So just say it with me. I love him because he first loved me. God bless you. Thank you.